Dilly is a very hairy dog. But we humans are sometimes called naked apes because we have so much less hair than our mammalian cousins. But if you look closely enough, you can find fine hair coming out of pores all over your body. Of course, some of us are hairier than others. But when and how did this hair and these mammary glands originate? Where do our arms come from? And are the origins of these structures so generic that we should expect aliens to have them too? Greetings, Earthlings. It's easy to assume that aliens have hair. And that's because we humans have hair. And we assume that they have memory glands. We have memory glands. And we have arms. And we have legs. And I'm standing here on legs thanks to these appendages that are hanging here. And here are two appendages here. Where did these guys come from? And why do we assume that aliens have them too? So, look at this. Hair. Hair is something. I got lots of hair here. But look at that. Superman has hair. Doctor Who has a full head of hair. Look at Chewbacca. He's almost he's just a big ball of hair. And then even Yoda has some hair coming out the top. What about mammary glands? You and I have mammary glands. And Superman has mammary glands. E.T. mammary glands. The Emperor has mammary glands. And these other things, these arms and their legs. Well, Superman has arms and legs. E.T. arms and legs. In fact, the arms come all the way down to the ground here. And then the uh, emperor has arms that you can see there. But all of those critters have arms and legs and mammary glands and hair. So that means essentially they're mammals like me, like you. Is that realistic? Let's have a look at where these things came from, how they evolved, and see if that makes sense to pretend that those same processes uh, happened on Krypton and the other planets that these aliens come from. Here is a tree of placental mammals. Now you can see at the very bottom that the common ancestor of elephants and humans was 105 million years ago. And you can see by looking at these pictures that all of those critters that are alive today have hair. So let's label them all have hair. My dog Dilly has hair, rabbits have hair, lemurs, tarsus, spider monkeys, everything has hair. If everything in this group has hair, that means that the common ancestor of all these things have hair. So that means that this blue triangle, everything in there has hair. All the dead critters, all of our ancestors had hair. But let's look a little deeper. This is for the past 105 million years. What happens if we go deeper? Let's look at the tetrapods, the quadrupeds. We have a frog on the left, humans on the right, and our common ancestor about 350 million years ago. And the blue triangle of hairy things is uh, on the right, upper right. But if you come to Australia, you will see kangaroos. And if you see a kangaroo, you will notice that it has hair. And if you're lucky enough to see a monotreme, an echidna, or a duckbill platypus, you will see that it too has hair. So we can make that blue triangle larger all the way back to our common ancestor 180 million years ago. What about earlier? Look at the chicken. Chicken represents the reptile. Reptiles have scales, chick birds, and chickens have feathers. Is that hair? Well, there have been scientists who investigate this question. What's the relationship between hair and uh, feathers and scales? Well, there's a paper there listed, and hair, feathers, and reptile scales are homologous. What that means is that they have a common ancestor. There was something earlier that evolved both into hair, feathers, and reptiles, and uh, reptile scales. So that means we can label this, whatever it is, this homologous stuff, we can label it proto-hair and make the tree a blue deeper. But we can continue this game. But to do that, we need to place this blue triangle on our billion years of evolution. So let's do that. There's the same blue triangle. And there's the proto-hair that includes now reptile scales and bird feathers. But what about proto-proto-hair? Is there something that we can call proto-proto-hair that even hagfish and sharks and fish have? Well, yes, there is. And here's the way we should understand that. That pink horizontal band is skin. And then we have some type of protective surface epithelia. And that protective surface epithelia 
evolves into something you might call a skin gland, giving off mucus or sebum, for example, to make the skin waterproof. And then that skin gland evolves and turns into not only protection, but also nutritional. It gives off things like lactose, and then it evolves into a mammary gland. It also produces hair or feathers or scales. And um, that shows how something simple can evolve and diverge and diversify into many different types of things, but the common origin is something as simple as a protective layer. Now, let's look at that a little bit more carefully in terms of a phylogenetic tree. So here on the left is time. Time starts 359 million years ago with what are called basal tetrapods. Those are ancient four-legged creatures. And on the left, they evolve into amphibians. On the right, they evolve into the blue, which are the mammals, and the red, which are the reptiles, the birds and the squamates. Squamates just a fancy word for lizards and snakes. So the red are the reptiles, the blue in the center are the mammals. And you can see that the mammals are in this gray box. There are three types of mammals, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the eutherians. The eutherians are the ones we're most familiar with, the placental mammals. And here's some pic there, the eutherians, and here's some pictures of two placental mammals, and they're, I guess, nursing. And uh, notice that the elephants also have two nipples in the front. And this is weird, and you can keep track of all the, the nipple distributions of all the mammals. If you look at dogs, you notice that they don't have nipples in the chest. They have them in the groin. And so there's a ch you can find on Wiki, uh, where are the nipples? They are, they are either thoracic nipples, abdominal nipples, or inguinal, or near the groin nipples. And you can see that the proboscidids, that's the elephants, and the primates have two thoracic nipples, two chest nipples, and none elsewhere. But pigs have six chests, six in the stomach, and six in the groin, and altogether they have 18. That's a lot of nipples. <laughs> so here's that chart again in the lower left, and the three types of, of uh, mammals are here. The monotremes here. You can see this is a duck-billed platypus, which has milk patches. They're not called tits. They're not called the nipples. They're called milk patches. And those two babies are sucking on the milk patches. They kind of squeeze them, and out comes a nice, rich milk. Then there are marsupials, and there's a kangaroo sucking on a tit there, and the, the lower beneath that are some possums sucking on the tits of their mother. And then on the right, we have the eutherians, placental mammals. We have the pig with its 18 nipples with all those piglets. And then we have two primates with their thoracic nipples. And then we have the elephant, and you can see there also having chest nipples. So here's hair. We started out with hair, and now we're talking about nipples. How did that happen? Well, we found out that hair came from proto-hair, and proto-hair meant also feathers and scales. And then we found out that proto-proto-hair included glands, which not only evolved into hair and sweat glands, but also into mammary glands. And if you're a real biologist, you call the common, these proto-proto-hair, or proto-proto-mammary glands, or proto-proto-feathers, you call them ectodermal placodes. And if you're, for more if you're interested in that some more, look up that word. Now, here are these placental mammals again. All have hair. 105 million years of common ancestor. And let's talk about something else, not just hair. Let's talk about uh, legs. So you notice that they all have legs. Well, to be a little bit more precise, we humans say we have two arms and two legs. But if we look at our ancestors, we see that those arms used to function as legs. Matter of fact, they're kind of proto-legs. Do spiders have, do spider monkeys have two legs and two arms? Well, they might be called two proto-arms and two legs. But if you look deeper into the tree, you look at rabbits and dogs and elephants, you can see that they have four legs. They don't have proto-anything. And so all of these critters you can consider to be quadrupeds. And uh, let's go deeper. Look at the frog on the left. It too has four legs, so all of these in the blue triangle are tetrapods or quadrupeds. Let's look deeper. Where did the legs come from? Well, here's that blue triangle again, and we're interested in where these legs came from. Well, look at the fish. But the, the distinction between fish and frogs, frogs have four legs and fish, they don't have any legs at all, but they have fins. Could it be that legs evolved from fins? Well, to look at that more carefully, Let's put another phylogenetic tree in which we look more carefully between fish and frogs. When we do that, notice that we have something called a coelacanth that shows up between frogs and fish. And that's interesting because if you look carefully at the coelacanth, look at this. The pec 
pectoral fins have lobe. They're called lobe fin fishes, and they look like they have muscles in them that can like, push against the ground at the bottom and kind of walk, swim. And so it's something in between fins and legs. And that's interesting because that's exactly what you expect. This is something called a coelacanth. Now, since we're interested in, really interested in how things started to be able to walk on land, how the origin of tetrapods, well, we figure out where could we go digging to find fossils of such things. And recently, um, in sediments that were about 375 million years old, there was something called Tiktaalik that was found. And this is a reconstruction or a picture of it, an artist's rendition of what it probably looked like. On the left, we see the fossil bones that were found with that triangular head. And on the right are the bones that were found inside of one of these appendages. So it's kind of like the shoulder and, and elbow. And as you can see, it's kind of like half like a fish, half like an amphibian. And that's exactly what you'd expect. So let's look deeper into the tree. We see fish. There's a fish on the bottom here. Notice it has pectoral fins. Notice it also has pec pelvic fins further back. And these fins evolved into arms and legs. But let's go back further. Where did they come from? Further back, we have cartilaginous fish, the common ancestor of cartilaginous fish and fish. And here's a current day fish, uh, not a fish, it's a shark. It's a jawed shark. And it too has pelvic fins and pectoral fins, which are the homologs of what will later become, at least later become uh, arms and legs. So we have reason to believe that the, the fins of the ancestors of these extant critters evolved into our four legs. So there we have four legs. We found out that, hey, fish and sharks have kind of proto-legs, so we'll call these fins four proto-legs. But what about going even deeper? When you look even deeper, these evolutionary biologists have found that the jawless fishes, represented here by a hagfish, some of them have lateral skin flaps. So where the, uh, where the pectoral fins come into existence. So here we have four legs coming from four proto-legs, i.e. fins, and those fins coming from maybe two proto-legs that are called lateral skin flaps, and who knows what's earlier than that. The point is that just like hair, as you go deeper and deeper into the origin of legs, you will find proto-legs and proto-proto-legs, and then they disappear into other structures, which you have a hard time saying that they're even proto-legs. So we've talked about hair and its origin and how that origin is integ integrally uh, connected with the origin of mammary glands. And we've talked about the origin of legs and how they are connected with fins and how the fins are kind of like lateral skin flaps. And so these features which we have today came from something earlier called Proto-X. And then that Proto-X came from Proto-Proto-X. And that theme is something that we will see over and over and over again in the evolution of things. And that might be important, it is important, to try to figure out whether aliens have hair or mammary glands and legs like we often portray them in the movies and comic books. So after a bit of evolutionary sleuthing, we find that our hair, our sweat glands, our mammary glands, our arms and our legs have origins deep in time. They all evolved from protoversions and protoprotoversions of what we have now. And if we go even further back in time, these protoprotoversions become unrecognizable. They disappear. And it becomes harder to say, this is what evolved into our hair. That is what became our legs. And rather than being generic, the origins of these features seems to be novel and unique features of a single species that then diverged. And the idea of assigning our hair and mammary glands and sweat glands and legs and arms to aliens all over the universe seems like a crazy idea.